Hi everybody, joining me today we have Dr. David F. Lancy. Uh, Dr. Lancy is Emeritus Professor of Anthropology at Utah State University. He is the author or editor of several books on childhood and culture, including cross-cultural studies in cognition and mathematics, studying children in schools, playing on the mother ground, cultural routines for children's learning, and anthropological perspectives on learning in childhood. Hi, Dr. Lancy. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. Thank you. I'm, in, I'm happy to participate. Oh, it's a pleasure to everyone. So, okay. So, just to begin with, and to put an initial question forth, uh, and to give basis for the conversation to branch afterwards. So, is play a universal feature of human nature and behavior? And if so, and even if it is universal, does it manifest itself in different ways in different cultures? Uh, Okay, that's a big question. First, <laughs> modify it a little bit. Let's talk about children's play okay. rather than play more generally because mm -hmm. that's such a very broad category. So if we're talking about children's play, then there are both universal aspects and there are uh, culturally variable aspects. Uh, you know, universal aspects are those that include, for instance, all children seem to be interested in handling and playing with objects, banging them, pounding them up and down. This seems to be universal. Um, all children seem to be interested in make-believe play. Um, the, where cult culture comes in, however, in several important respects. First of all, in a modern, industrialized, educated society, what we sometimes now call weird society, uh, the elite society, in that society, much of children's make-believe play is actually invented. It involves invented scenarios, invented characters, and this is drawn from t television, videos, video games, storybooks, and so on. In the village, don't have any of those things. So the make-believe play is pretty much exclusively focused on what children actually see around them, uh, particularly the older uh, uh, children and adults working. So there's a, a lot of make-believe play, mimics very closely uh, adult work patterns. And those, so that's a major cultural divide between, say, our society and pretty much everybody else. Then this, another interesting divide that, 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 vary, that, that it has, shows a cultural influence on children's play has to do with band size, what we call in the anthropology band size, which is really the size of the community. It makes a huge difference. So a typical foraging band, let's say, these are hunters and gatherers. The typical band may be 40, 50 people. Out of that total 40, 50, there may be 10 children. So that means that the play group really is of mixed ages. And that's at least partly because the older kids have to look after the younger kids. But basically, you're dealing with a mixed group of kids, which imposes severe constraints on play. Play tends to be cooperative, not competitive. It tends to be simple, not very complex. You don't see complex games. On the other hand, in a, in a larger community, a larger village, 500 or where population in the hundreds, under those circumstances, you begin to get play groups that are same age, same gender. Under those circumstances, you begin to see competitive play, you see teams, you see much more complex rules and so on and so forth. It begins to look a little bit more like our games and play. Um, another major cultural difference between our own society and everyone else is that in our society adults are very heavily involved with children's play. We manage their play, we, we supervise it, if it's sports we coach it, um, we, we make sure that children abide by rules and so on. So there's a great deal of adult involvement. Parents play with their children at home. You don't see that outside uh, our own contemporary society. You don't see it historically, you don't see it cross-culturally. 
children uh, are a high, have a high degree of autonomy normally, and play in particular is not taken very seriously by adults. Um, that is, they think it's a good thing, particularly if it keeps kids busy and out of their way, but it isn't something that requires the adult involvement, adult presence. Um, older children are supposed to be looking after and protecting younger children. When that system breaks down, then an adult may intervene to chastise the older child. But generally speaking, not in a, they don't, they're not concerned enough to get directly involved or to observe. Uh, if anything, I've overheard adults grumbling about how noisy play children were at play and wish they'd play somewhere else and they're making a mess and so on and so forth. So those are some of the major similarities or commonalities and differences. Mm -hmm. Great. So, um, and you were also talking about the behavior that comes from adults, uh, um, let's say teaching behavior. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, it is different uh, when it comes to children's play. Uh, th that means that in weird societies, and for people who don't know, who don't know weird is the acronym for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and developed, right? So uh, for, for adults and parents in these societies, they tend to direct much more children's play and also how children learn in general, right, in comparison with more traditional societies. Y yes. Um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a major difference between uh, weird society uh, and, um, again, everyone else, the rest of the world. And as recently as my own childhood, <laughs> let's see, am I saying that in the right way? Um, well, let's just say as recently as 50 years ago, 60 years ago, um, the childhood that I experienced, that my peers experienced, that my kin, my cousins, my kin experienced was vastly different than today's childhood. Uh, we had much, much more freedom. My parents never played with me. Uh, they did read me storybooks when I was very, very little, and which undoubtedly fostered a love of, of reading, which was a good thing. But they certainly didn't play with me. They didn't have games at home that we played. Um, and uh, they're, they're just very busy. Basically, I had the freedom to go out and roam around the neighborhood in, in the forests and with playmates um, or just play on my own. I mean, that was, and that was very typical. And when I, when I give talks or when I do, I have a blog and I post very often I'll get a very, uh, that sort of response. That is, people writing me say, oh, you're, this is exactly what I experienced as a child growing up. And it's so different now. It's so changed. Um, so uh, just, just parents are much, much, much more involved with their children in a whole variety of ways in terms of managing their lives, uh, micromanaging their lives, some would say. And... Um, and this includes a lot more teaching. One of, the, one of the statistics that I ran across not too long ago that you may be familiar with, Ricardo, is, the, is that there is this there's an interesting relationship. Um, the birth rate is obviously going down. Um, and, and, of course, it's, it's gone very far down in weird society. One of the characteristics of weird childhood is that Children are growing up in much smaller families with fewer siblings, um, and and one consequence may be that parents are somehow filling a gap where there's a lack of playmates. Um, but <clears throat> as the birth rate goes down, paradoxically, parent involvement in their, with their children, investment, parental time spent in childcare, this is this is measured um, continuously at least in the United States, by um, some government agencies that take periodic surveys to determine the, the time budgets of people, how much time people are spending, men and women, of course, married, unwary, and all this. And it's so interesting. We're having fewer kids, but we're spending far more time on them. And you say, well, why would that be the case? They're healthier than they've been in the past. They should need less care that way. 
Uh, they're far safer in terms of things like child safety seats and other safety devices. So they're 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 much less vulnerable. So why are why are we take, spending so much more time? Well, I would I would argue the reason we're spending so much more time is simply that the culture is driving this intensive parenting, and it's become a movement, and the bar keeps getting higher and higher and higher. I mean, it, it, whether it's being anxious and concerned about your child's diet and wanting to make sure they're only getting organic baby foods, or uh, whether it's, it's spending hours and hours and hours shopping for your children to get them just exactly the right thing that they want or need. Um, we're just spending far, far more time on our children uh, out of some mistaken sense that they'll be better off <laughs> for all this attention. I would argue uh, perversely that um, probably we're smothering children, we're, we're, um, we're, uh, we're handicapping them in many ways, we're not giving them enough freedom, we're not giving them enough responsibility. And so I think this is a really alarming trend. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that's interesting. Would you say that uh, perhaps because nowadays the environments where children develop are much more uh, much safer uh, than they would have been in in ancient times, let's say, and even in places where more traditional societies live, even nowadays. Would you say that that it would be important for for parents to leave the, their children alone while playing? And I mean, nowadays most most places where where children play are are pretty safe so and and even for them to to be uh, to be more free to interact with one another and develop their social skills let's say absolutely um, i mean this the overprotection perspective uh, comes from i mean it, it's 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 got multiple components it isn't just one issue it has to do with the physical safety of the child. It has to do with exaggerated anxiety about child kidnapping. Uh, it has to do with over concern about the child's self-esteem, uh, their emotional well-being, their emotional health. I mean, we've gotten to the point now where uh, getting your knee scraped is is a major tragedy, or. Or, or being snubbed by one's peers is a cause for a visit to the psychologist. Um, uh, we, we treat children as extremely fragile, uh, as, as requiring uh, great care and attention, whereas in fact, at least if we can judge based on history and human evolution, uh, children really in effect, are designed by nature to be self-guided, self-starting, self-initiating. Uh, in the villages where I visit and study and my colleagues, and we have ethnographic accounts, um, we, we see parents leaving children alone, letting them figure things out on their own, because they're really eager to do so. They don't want to continue to be, in effect, um, low-class citizens. Um, uh, many, many societies don't even give a name to a child, a permanent name, until they're three or four or five older, until they have, they're more person-like. Um, and so the, um, the attitude is the, kid, the kid's going to figure things out, get and get stand on their own two feet, and um, learn how to be useful, learn how to participate, learn how to get what they need. And uh, there's no reason for us to waste a lot of time uh, guiding and teaching and protecting and so on because they'll figure it out on their own. Mm -hmm. and, and do you think that the reason for that to happen is that in more traditional societies because they have different uh, eco ecological circumstances uh, that parents uh, and even the other people who help with hello parenting and so on, uh, they have to think more about how to allocate their few resources and, and to make decisions about the time they spend with children and if they orient their learning more or less and so on. And because in more affluent societies, uh, people don't really have to be worried about that 
that, that that could be a good reason why parents in more affluent societies tend to worry more about uh, how, their sh how their children develop and so tend to interfere more in that? Uh, no, no doubt. Uh, certainly, one of the consequences of high infant and child mortality, and this is, this is, I mean, when you look at the statistics, it's, it's much improved today and it's improving rapidly around the world. But if you look at the statistics, up, upwards of 40 or 50 percent of children don't make it to age five. That's bound to have a conditioning effect on how much investment a parent is willing to make in the child. If the child seems to be chronically ill, well, <clears throat> uh, parents uh, re reduce their reduce their investment. Uh, but what what strikes me in these situations, it's not just that parents are busy. It's not just that parents um, don't think it's worthwhile spending time investing in their children because their children might not survive. It it's even leisure, the adult leisure, or the leisure of older children, their, their opportunities to gossip, their opportunities to kick back and enjoy themselves, um, they, those are, those are, they will devote time to those concerns and ignore a pestering child or distract it. So, I mean, they're more likely to hand a child a tool, like a knife even, a toddler. <laughs> Here, go play with this. I mean, literally, people see this and record it in amazement. So you'll see parents doing various things to just kind of uh, get the child out of the way, stop bothering me. I'm, I'm just relaxed here, having a good time. And, uh, and so generally speaking, what people report very consistently is this. During early infancy, the earliest stages of the child's life, mothers are very attentive. They don't necessarily, one of your questions has to do with mother ease, for example. They don't necessarily do a lot of talking to their babies or uh, holding them all fast and making eyes and so on and so forth. We do that a great deal. It's not necessarily universal at all. But, but, <clears throat> They do respond very quickly and, and nurse the baby. Above all, the, and especially if they're able to nurse the baby and go on working or gossiping or whatever it is they're doing. I mean, they're, they're more than happy to give attention to an infant that they can care for simultaneously with doing something, something else. Um, also, they're more than willing to have allo parents, as you mentioned, usually older older children, older girls, older siblings that, that are there to take the baby and hold it, rock it, hold it while it's asleep. Um, so the infant gets, gets a lot of attention and care to make sure that it's comfortable. If it's fussy, it's unhappy, some, it, will be, it will be attended to, no question. Once children reach the age of toddlers, um, they're kind of, they should be sort of seen and not heard. They're, they're expected to remain more or less in the vicinity of their mothers, at least until they're truly mobile, um, beyond crawling. And, but but other, otherwise, ideally, stay out of the way. Don't not get in the way. And uh, obviously, the kids, they do just fine. Uh, and in particular, learning, they, they, the, the, the thing that strikes me about this is, is that children figure things out on their own amazingly. And, and they're, they learn how to use tools. They learn how to use the tools properly. They learn proper speech. They learn proper manners, etiquette, uh, through observation and through being ignored or rebuffed if, if they didn't get it right. Um, they're encouraged, you know, try again, pay more attention, listen, watch. <laughs> Those are the kind, that's the, the extent of the teaching is just to say, look, to remind the child, it's your job to learn how to do these things and, and don't bother me or don't get, don't get in the way until you're competent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's interesting that uh, children can learn all of that by 
their own, let's say. Uh, uh, and uh, since you already ta uh, touched a bit on mother is, I, I would like to go back to that because I would like to ask you uh, if there is uh, some particular kinds of behaviors that are universal about mother's behavior that, uh, when it is directed toward their, their children. Because, uh, I mean, m uh, when we talk about mother is, there, there are many people, particularly psy psychologists and linguists, that say that one of the reasons why children acquire lang language is because adults uh, use this uh, talk to children in this specific way they call mother is that is I in pitch hyper articulated and so on uh, and I mean this doesn't happen in all uh, in all cultures does it so uh, and e even even things like uh, mothers uh, looking a lot to children's faces and to the eyes and things like that that is also not an universal right exactly yeah i think um you're absolutely right uh, child psychology i mean one the term weird which we've used a couple of times as you know arose from a very important research study where the authors uh, used used they pointed out that the data that we have in psychology especially on human development is almost entirely taken from research with from, with subjects from a modern western educated rich society not elsewhere and further bias is that a very high proportion of the subjects in those studies are college students because they're a ready source of subjects in, in experiments. So there's this very, very limited sample, and, and so that means that much of the theory as well has, it has this limitation. So when people do research on parent-child interaction, it usually is with weird parents and children. And whatever is observed, such as the use of mother ease, such as the use of pointing, for example, mutual gaze and all these things, are because they are ubiquitous and universal within these studies in weird societies, the authors simply extrapolate to the world, to the globe, to the species, without checking, without really saying, well, you know, it, because they just assume it's not at all, it's, it's, it's hardwired, it's all hardwired. The behavior of the parents is hardwired, the behavior of the children is hardwired, it's all evolved, and never occurring to them that, well, maybe not all parents use mother ease, or not all parents engage in face-to-face -face, uh, communication and pointing and so on. Well, the st cross-cultural studies show that it isn't. It, those those behaviors are not a universal, and in fact, as often as, as not, um, we find uh, mothers, particularly ho if they're holding their baby and kind of jiggling them uh, to settle them down or, or whatever, hold them facing away from themselves, away from themselves, towards other people. And uh, I've seen a few uh, occasions when and the anthropologists have sort of said, well, why are you doing that? What's that about? And the consensus of opinion is that, um, the consensus of opinion is, is that what the mother is doing is basically marketing her baby to all parents. And in a number of societies where this has been observed, mothers take considerable care to keep their infants looking nice, uh, not crying, being pleasant, and again, marketing them. Um, and, in, and even, in effect, creating these conversations in which the infant is talking to the visitor. as In a sense, the mother is using the child almost like a ventriloquist dummy <laughs> in, order, in order to establish a relationship between the infant and potential caretakers who will relieve the mother of the full-time care of the child. Um, more generally, more broadly, Ricardo, on this on this issue, we might take up attachment theory. Attachment theory is a is a really good example right now because, on the one hand, it is accepted as gospel 
truth, you might say, that um, there is this process that occurs later in infancy, and it's universal, where uh, mothers and their infants go through this process, or mothers, or, or yeah, some discussion about fathers as well, but they go through this bonding process, attachment process to the infant, and uh, they, they, or not, so that this attachment, the whole notion of attachment is, is a fragile thing. This is, this is that, uh, that if, if the parent doesn't do it right somehow, or if the parent doesn't invest sufficient time and energy and bonding with the infant, then the, then the, the infant will be what's referred to as insecurely attached, which will create emotional problems down the road. Well, anthropologists en masse, at least a dozen different anthropologists have written critical essays or articles saying, in effect, look, much of what is supposed to happen in this attachment process does not happen in the particular culture or cultures that we've been looking at that you have, for instance, a baby being passed off to others. Um, how, how can you have this big attachment, this big bonding process, when the infant is actually, and the infant and toddler are actually cared for by maybe as many as a dozen, up to 20 people in some societies? It's, just, it's like the child is community property. Um, not to say that they don't have stronger or weaker relationships with some people than others. Fathers, fathers are AWOL. Fathers, generally speaking, with with very few exceptions, fathers aren't involved at all. So as far as attachment to fathers, we can't. How could you speak of that? So essentially, what anthropologists are saying is this: this attachment is a is a is a cultural phenomenon. It is not a biological phenomenon. That that essentially, if if an infant is cared for. Uh, by, I mean, its needs are met, not only for food, but for whatever comfort it, 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 it requires. If those needs are consistently met, the child will not have any emotional disorder as a result of, of this. That the, the, the whole attachment idea actually arose from a very extreme situation of child neglect, namely the, the children in World War II, who were orphaned, or uh, who, or in, or in more more modern times in Romania, orphaned children who were warehoused in orphanages and received almost no attention, and were left to kind of stew in their own waste in just horrible, horrible conditions. And yes, they had emotional problems, but that's extreme. And so I think um, my own feeling is uh, attachment is an artifact of our mo of our modern culture, both the th both the reality of it, if there is a reality, and the theory uh, are are strictly culture bound and cannot be generalized to the world. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that you talk about attachment because I would like to ask you about how children learn in traditional societies about kinship. Because, mm -hmm. And even other social roles, because I mean, uh, coming from studies on developmental psychology and so on, we know that children, even when they are still in the uterus, uh, c can distinguish between their mother's voices and uh, and other people's voices and so on. <laughs> and when they are born, they they pay more attention to or have different reactions to their mother's voice and to other people's voices. So it seems that at least the attachment with the mother is innate. But what about the the other people in the family and, and if it branches from the mother to the father and then to the grand fathers and and so on and to the uncles and aunts and so on so so is the way children learn about kinship mostly cultural or does it has some kind of innate aspect to it um remind me to come back to the question of uh, mother ease because it was a point we didn't get uh, on that that i think we should have dealt with I think the the issue of the uh, 
the, the, the child recognizing its mother's voice compared to others, it makes a great deal of sense. Why wouldn't the fetus have the ability to pick up the, the uh, phonetic uh, signature, if you will, of its own mother? And, and, and somehow respond to that more readily than to any other uh, verbalization from, from others. That makes perfectly good sense. I don't think we need an elaborate theory of attachment to, to account for something like that. As far as other people in the community is concerned, um, I think it's driven by who is involved with that child. I mean, I think there's, I think there's considerable evidence that if you if you must talk about attachment, then you can talk about degrees of attachment. And and infants, children have favorites. Um, not necessarily does not necessarily sp uh, sort of spread out in the way that you describe. The father, for example, is not is not high generally on the list of people with whom a child spends time. Ch fathers are not generally involved in caretaking with some exceptions. Again, with grandparents, you know, we think about human mortality, lifespan, uh, grandparents may not be available. They, they may be deceased or too elderly to care. So they're not necessarily prime either, Al although the grandmother is statistically more often, certainly more often than the grandfather, more often than say, aunts or great aunts. But, um, it, 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 it depends on who's, who the primary caretaker is, the most effective caretaker. It may be an older sibling. It may be, it may be uh, a, a, the mother's sister, an aunt. So, um, so that, that to me is the child is going to form attachments. There's some questions. Form emotional bonds. Why, why not? And is going to form emotional bonds with whoever it is that is most reliable as a caretaker and most affectionate, and and so on. Um, and but kin, kin, kinship also involves other things. It involves um, involves a vocabulary, the naming conventions for different. It also, in many societies, involves some very strict rules about how you interact with politeness and manners and 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 so on. How you interact with different members of your family, extended family, particularly beyond the nuclear family. And in those cases, children learn those things largely the way they learn everything else, particularly the way they learn language. But what's interesting is that there are a few societies, particularly in, in the Pacific, where rank and social status are so important that children are actually coached or actually taught kinship terminology and kinship appropriate behavior vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other kin. So that's a, that's a rare example of teaching, and it's done in the context of learning kinship terminology, not because children wouldn't eventually learn those terms and behaviors. It's just they don't learn them fast enough for the f family. The family is concerned that the child will embarrass them by committing some social faux pas, and so they take the trouble to really prep the child so that it doesn't violate those things. We were, I want to come back to when we were talking about Mother Ease. And um, although the, 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 although Mother, uh, what I'm saying is that Mother Ease may not be that critical, the impact of Mother Ease and other kinds of communication with children, with infants, um, including baby signs, this new trend now to, to begin to use signing with your babies, um, which is which is nobody would claim would be was a universal. Um, they do have an impact. They, they are important. They are critical, having to do with the development of the child's uh, vocabulary, having to do with the complexity of the child's speech. Okay, so the um, we've got as you know, very, very strong evidence that parents that are very, very highly verbal with their children, and this, this varies enormously cross-culturally, weird society, very, very, very highly verbal. Elsewhere, even in uh, kind of lower class population in weird nations, 
um, among the lower class, among the working class, not nearly as much verbalization between parent and child. And the consequence of the high degree of verbalization is the child develops um, much more complex language and much, much greater vocabulary, which facilitates learning in school. So there is, there is a, there is a instrumental connection here between mother ease and all those other uh, speech special child register uh, special register speech patterns and so on there is a payoff but only in weird society so it sort of makes sense within weird society if education is important um, then that all that uh, verbalization between um, to the child with the child interaction with the to verbal interaction with the child becomes very very important and contributes to their success in education but I would argue in general it's not universal and it's not necessarily functional uh, in in societies where there's schooling is not important or non-existent mm -hmm. so what would you say is that uh, mother is is not strictly necessary for the children to acquire language, but it facilitates it, right? On the one hand, mm -hmm. and then on the other end, it it allows for the child to reach a higher level in terms of verbal fluency. Yeah, I think it becomes functional and is rewarded, and 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 it becomes a very important part of child rearing practices when education becomes important to the success and, and well-being of the child. Schooling becomes very important. It, it isn't, I mean, if you look around the world, there are a lot of places in the world, third world countries, where kids go to school but don't actually get very far with schooling. They, the schooling is so bad or there are no jobs if you do have schooling. So essentially it's, 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 it's a meaningless experience. But in, as, as soon as schooling becomes functional and leads to improvements in living standard and leads to employment and so on, then this whole change in parenting becomes um, meaningful, worthwhile. And in a sense, then we can begin to say, well, um, children need to be better prepared for school. They need preschool experiences. They need more verbal and language input input as very young children in order for them to succeed in school. If, if schooling is not, a, is not a critical part of being successful in that society, then, then all of that language input seems superfluous. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, it seems that it's children who take the opportunity due to their natural proclivities they exhibit to go after older people, adults and, other, and older children and take social learning opportunities as they occur in their society, right? So that being said, would you say that this puts a strong emphasis on the biological slash innate components of children's play and social learning and that different types of teaching behavior are the things that are cultural in this equation? Yes, absolutely. That the um, <clears throat> I think children are the ones that are hardwired to learn. Uh, adults are not hardwired to teach. They're not. There isn't some sort of automatic complex meme, if you will, <clears throat> that um, that that adults somehow. Uh, have from um, a part of their genetic inheritance, there's not, there's not some mechanisms that they can roll out and engage with the child and then become, you know, essentially raise the child through their direct intervention. No, if there's any hardwiring, if any memes, they're in the kid, <laughs> the child, and <laughs> not the adult. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, are there some very specific art to acquire socially adventurable uh, behaviors that children can't learn by themselves or only via imitation or modulation or some, or some process like that, that adults or older children uh, in fact have to intervene in order for the younger children to acquire these kinds of knowledge? 
In a very broad, general sense, no. I don't think there. I don't think there are any. Um, in on a case by case basis, um, we find in the ethnographic record uh, a child struggling to learn something, and there may be some point at which an adult noticing this and deciding that that uh, child is going to just get more and more frustrated that they can't complete this task, maybe deciding and thinking also, well, the child is old enough. In other words, the adult doesn't automatically intervene. First of all, the adult does not initiate the learning process. It's got to be initiated by the child. Secondly, an adult will make a decision uh, in terms of the child, the child learning this could fine on their own or with help from peers. Everything is going smoothly. No, the child has hit an obstacle. Well, they still may not intervene if the child has hit a consistent obstacle because they may decide, you know, they really should leave this alone. You especially see this in craft skills like weaving and so on, where it's like, you know, don't worry about that. Don't, 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 you're, you're trying too much. Um, but, but then we reach a point, again, extremely rare reported in the literature, very rare that this happens, but we reach a point where the child just is really struggling, and an adult may very briefly intervene and just demonstrate this is how this is done. Or say something like, no, do that, do it this way, no, do it that way. And it's a very brief, very, very brief assistance, not offered to all children, at this, and it's not, it's not like a lesson across all children or anything. It's just a strategic intervention. And it really, when you come down to it, it doesn't have anything to do with parents and children or adults and children because it could, it could very well be the same, same behavior could be exchanged between two adults. I mean, two men out, out hunting or trapping or something. One, one more experienced or just knows how to do something shows the other one how to do it because the other one can't, doesn't know how, can't do it. It isn't automatically like there's this uh, subordinate superior relationship, you're my apprentice. No, it's we're partners. We're on the hunt together. We're doing or trapping together. We're doing stuff together. And you're struggling with something. You can't figure it out. And I know how to do that. And I will just intervene quickly and show you how to do that. So again, it's not triggered by adult child. It's triggered by the affiliation that's there between two partners in an enterprise um, or two members of a family or two members of a community. And um, so that's that's the, when you see, it's quite rare, but that's when you see an intervention um, to rectify uh, a, a, an inability to complete a task because of lack of skill or knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I'm curious because um, last week or two weeks ago I talked with uh, David C. Geary and we were talking about um, teaching basically uh, and the, edu the, modern, the modern education system and we also talked a little bit about how children learn in more traditional societies and uh, for example, one example that came to my mind was if uh, to learn how to produce, for example, a spear that, that is a complex piece of technology for an animal to produce, if the child to do, uh, to do that, uh, to produce a complex piece of technology, the, simply through observation and imitation and emulation and, and by uh, trying it by themselves, the, uh, they can really learn how to produce it without any oriented teaching. Yeah. What, I mean, that the way you framed the question, Ricardo, is, is, the, is skeptical. You're, you're, you're you're, there's the skepticism there. You're basically saying, are, are you really, do you mean this, that the child could learn how to make this complex spear all on their own? First thing you have to realize is that child is learning to make that spear or that bow and arrow over, I mean, if it's a complex multi-part spear, they will, that learning will take place over maybe as many as 20 years. Okay, 
That is from the time that the child first sort of becomes aware of things that can be thrown as weapons. <laughs> and, and maybe as a three-year-old picks up a stick and starts to throw an imaginary target and then works their way up to taking the stick now and shaping it, breaking off a branch or two, shaping it a little bit. Um, and maybe at the age of eight or ten, uh, an older brother will give the child a, a well-made spear so that they can, not necessarily an adult weapon, but scaled down and maybe not the very best quality manufacturer, but, but a credible spear that actually could kill a rat or a bird. And so the child, maybe at 10 or 12, is now working with a pretty good spear um, that someone has made for them. So they have a chance to appreciate the design, appreciate the materials that are going in there. And of course, they have the opportunity to observe uh, the spear maker. They can watch for hours and nobody objects. Um, they can uh, and so, uh, so just to interrupt you there, uh, the, these types of spears that adults give to children, could we classify them as toys? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. The, okay. Exactly the point, that the toys that are given to children or that they make up, create on their own, are actually tools in non-weird societies. And that's... That's extremely important when we make when I make this generalization that kids can learn on their own. We got to realize that their whole entire play apparatus, pretty much, as well as the the props that they're using, are all copied from life and are are are, are scaled down or crude representations of the actual tools, the actual work tasks, and so on. That, and it's this long time period. It's this long, long period of learning and practice. So when you think about making it, you think about making a tool um, like a comp compound bow or a complex spear that's, let's say, composed of many components. Um, we we would think about a you know a four week class or something uh, with with, uh, with or maybe maybe even a twenty four hour period. We would learn how to make this with an instructor. That's our society, you know, where everything is accelerated. We don't have 20 years to learn how to make spear. Um, um, so, so the child is learning to make the spear, for, particularly with respect to, to, to uh, bow and arrow hunting, spear hunting, hunting larger mammals and so on. We know that actually the s success and skill peaks at 30 and 40 years old. So that that's think consider how long that learning curve is, and um, and so so I think it becomes it becomes a little more believable. Well, maybe yeah, you could if you had thirty years to do this, you might be able to become expert pretty much without anybody actually ever teaching you anything. Um, um, but um, um, I, I think a useful term here to think about is the term opaque. Um, and um, many, many of the contemporary theories about um, the, the role of teaching in child development focus on um, things that are opaque, the things that the child needs to know about, learn about that, that are opaque. The, the, the argument goes, it, you can't figure things out on your own because the actual uh, inner workings or uh, what goes into making this task is not visible, is opaque. Well, in the, in the village situation, but pretty much everything is transparent. It is not opaque. It's an open book. And this is one of the huge differences between weird society and one of the reasons why teaching is so critical in our society is so much of what we need to know is opaque. It's, it's, it's hidden in literature. It's hidden in books. It's, it's, um, it's hidden in the fact that our machinery, our tools are very complex. I mean, I can go out to my tool shed, for example, and I can find a hammer. Nothing opaque about a hammer, 
but I can also find a, um, a hedge trimmer that has a motor and a battery and has has oscillating and offsetting blades and even so it's still a pretty simple tool not that hard to learn to use even by inspection but you can see well, maybe somebody wouldn't have a little guidance you need a little guidance on that uh, with that but but ultimately when we consider you know trigonometry and and medical practice all these areas of, of learning and knowledge in our society in order to get a job to where they can practice as a doctor, they could spend their whole life just observing and trying to pick up things from observation. In fact, many doctors have done that and have actually um, been arrested. They, were, they didn't have the credentials. They successfully impersonated a doctor. Um, but by and large, we need teaching, we need education, lessons and schools and so because so much of what we need to know is survive is opaque. Whereas in the village it's it's not transparent and amenable, very amenable to be learning uh, through observation. Uh, so uh, yeah. in in more modern industrialized societies is it possible to notice these distinctions in terms of teaching behavior coming from adults? For example, when we compare the behavior from between mothers and fathers that belong to low-income classes and from and with the ones from the upper classes. I'm sorry, Ricardo. You got to read. I'm not sure I understand the question. Or oh, oh, the oh question. okay, okay, okay. Uh, what I'm asking is that if this distinction uh, in terms of teaching behavior that, that we see between traditional societies and more modern industrialized ones, uh, if, if that difference, we can also see it when we compare the teaching behavior oh. of mothers and fathers that belong to low-income classes in the same industrialized countries and the upper classes. Right, thank you. I, I I understand your point now, and yes, I I, uh, I think this is a really a good a good comparison, because you, you're right. It isn't just the, the sort of modern, westernized societies versus the rest of the world. It actually, what's interesting about the teaching in particular, especially teaching, is we've got a lot of research that suggests that that working class people, poverty class people, um, don't really believe in teaching their children beyond some, some limited extent to keep them safe, you know, like in a ghetto situation, in a very impoverished community, you want to give the child some rules about if there's gunfire, hit the floor kind of thing, or don't unlock the door for strangers. Um, but by and large, uh, what, what parents say if they're from working class is they'll say, look, that's the teacher's job. That's why I send a child to school. It's a teacher's job to, to teach. We have a lot of sociolinguistic research, many, many studies over long periods of time that show that in the working classes, lower classes, there's much less adult-child verbalization, much less adult-child conversation. Um, the speech that is directed from adults to children tends to be directive, um, punitive in many cases, but it's pretty much do this, do that, go there, very short sentences, very short directive language, um, not at all the sort of complex conversations that occur in the upper strata of society. So, yes, absolutely, um, um, the, the, the story, if you will, that unfolds when we make the comparison between the non-traditional uh, indigenous peoples and modern weird society, that story of, of parent-child inter interaction, child rearing, that story is replicated to a great extent uh, just within 
a developed country like the, the United States, the UK, any any of the European countries, it's replicated within because if you look at the non-elites, they're doing much less teaching, much less verbalization, much less language interaction with their children, uh, more like the indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm, exactly. So, and, and I mean, in traditional society, children acquire... Uh, all this knowledge uh, just by imitating and observing and so on. But uh, what about uh, gender roles? Because it seems that there is at least uh, somewhat of an innate component because from a certain age, and it's an early age, children uh, t uh, tend to join together in sex-specific play activities. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, it's also true that uh, and this also happens in traditional societies, uh, uh, that uh, adults tend to criticize children when they, uh, when they manifest certain behaviors that don't go along with the gender they belong to, right? Yes. You know, they're, they're absolutely true. And, and um, I, I mentioned earlier, a little earlier, that in the Pacific, uh, they're very, very concerned about rank and social status and that children should should be made aware of this at an early age so that they don't commit um, a, a social faux pas. Um, but it's, but it's, it's that type of intervention to really strenuously train children in proper etiquette. Um, that's, that's, that's not universal. That's not widespread. It's limited as I said, to the Pacific and, and a few other societies, particularly in East Asia, East Asia, another place where uh, the, the proper etiquette with strangers and so on. The same thing is true of gender roles. Uh, there, many societies are relatively relaxed about um, things like dress for the, or undress, as the case may be. Very relatively relaxed about mixing of gender roles among children. Other societies, however, are much, much stricter, much more uh, uh, punitive, if you will, for children who stray across the gender divide. Um, but, but, but still, by and large, there's not a lot of care or intervention that occurs to guide children into the correct uh, pathway gender-wise because the kids kind of do it themselves. They don't need a lot of urging or pushing to uh, adopt uh, gender-appropriate behaviors especially because, for instance, girls are very, very attracted to what their mothers are doing. They're, they're very interested. Um, there's, a, there's a term that I like very well that was coined applies broadly to primates, not just humans, and it's called baby lust, baby lust. I know whether you've heard that term. But essentially, young, young females, and I've seen this with vervet monkeys and other primate species, it's very striking. The young females want to be around babies. They want to hold babies. They want to, they, 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 they have baby lust. And so, uh, from the point of view of, say, of a little girl who's five or six, her mother and her new infant are just about the coolest thing in town. And then she is want to want to be around and nearby and have her hand on that baby, hold that baby, you know, pretend that she's nursing that baby. Um, and similarly, little girls want to be helpful to their mothers. They want to be their mother's assistants. Now, with boys, it's a little different. They would like to be um, in the company of their fathers and uh, men. Generally, they aspire there. But men's work is such, especially if the hunting and gathering society, that they don't want kids around. Kids are in the way. They can scare away the game. And other kinds of work that that, that men do, adult men do, that's not so conducive to having their sons as helpers. 
So boys are oriented much more towards peers. So you, so boys tend to gather in what are called in some cases gangs. So they're 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 they're, they're they, the boys are much more likely to be in independent groups. So to the extent that that little boys are looking for role models, they may be looking for that role model in, among their older brothers or their older cousins, as contrasted with the girls whose role model is going to be a mother, maybe a grandmother, maybe an aunt, but someone who's a, who's a, who's a female they've grown up with. Um, and um, so gender roles tend to get sorted out, again, pretty much without a whole lot of intervention or fuss, they just, there's just a sort of natural gravitation to the appropriate behaviors and appropriate activities. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so, uh, and now about child rearing, and perhaps the, your answer will go along the one you gave about the spear, <laughs> but um, uh, would you say that uh, via, again, imitation, observation, and so on, girls are able to pick up all they need from other women about uh, how to rear children until they reach the, uh, reproductive age? Uh, that would be a question. And the other one is, uh, and if they, if they not, would you say that hello parenting is important in human societies and particularly in more traditional ones because uh, the, uh, this allows for women and children to have access to more resources and to have help given by other people uh, or, or that it is really necessary because uh, women uh, would need the help from more experienced women to be able to rear children. Um, that's um, yeah, it's a really, really, a really interesting issue, interesting question. Um, that uh, this is this is um, how to raise children, right? And in our own society today. It uh, produces a lot of angst, a lot of a lot of anxiety and concern. Uh, when some years ago, when I was working on the first issue, first volume of, the, of my book, The Anthropology of Childhood, I have section on parenting. You know, several chapter on parenting and some section on modern parenting. And just out of curiosity, I went to the bookstore. We still had bookstores at that time. <laughs> Went to this large bookstore and looked at this shelf of parenting guides, parenting manuals. And, and it was a huge area of the bookstore. It was all these books on how to be a parent, how to raise children. All this information. And of course, you have blogs. You have mommy blogs. You have uh, TV programs and and all this focused on child rearing and you say well why why is it necessary to have all this instruction all this uh, 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 expert opinion expertise and so on and I, I would argue exactly that what's happened is that in the village setting little girls like the spear example the little girls are basically learning how to be a mother from their own infancy, I mean, from their own childhood, they're observing, they're in the presence of mother, other mothers, other babies, other children, they're watching the interaction, <clears throat> uh, they're, uh, at an early age, they're going to be given an infant to care for, and they're going to be scrutinized by adult women in their interaction with children, in their interaction with babies. Many societies also report that a young mother, first-time mother, is scrutinized very carefully by, depending on where, where they're living, I mean, it's likely to be her, her husband's mother and her, kin, her female kin, going to watch her very closely and criticize how she's handling that baby. So the allo parenting model, ironically, I mean, it reduces the burden of childcare on the mother. 
But ironically, the owl parenting model also provides um, 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 scaffolding and input and assistance to the mother, makes her a more successful mother. Um, our society, what do we, what have we got? First of all, we have um, very small families. So I don't know what the statistics are, but let's say a, a girl born in, in middle, mid to upper class society in the United States, uh, that girl is likely to grow up with no younger siblings, okay? I, she may have an older sibling, but again, the probability is she won't have another, she won't get to observe her mother caring for an infant. Our, we're isolated. We don't live in villages in mud huts. So that means that maybe next door there's a mother with a new baby. But our, 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 our child of seven or eight or nine may never get to see that. You know, it, it all depends. If there are friendly relations, if there's interaction between the two homes, sure, but not necessarily. They may not, you know. So, and and again, a lot of our caretaking of infants and children in the village is transparent. It's out there. It's happening right in front of everyone. Whereas in our society, it's hidden indoors. Consider, for example, how controversial public breastfeeding is. We actually have pass laws that protect women who nurse their babies in public, if you can imagine. And I've seen women nurse their babies in public in which they discreetly hid them under a blanket. You can't even tell. I mean, you you know. So our, our prototypical seven-year-old girl, who I would argue is at a critical age in terms of being real interested in babies, really interested in, in, in how parenting gets done, does not have the opportunity to see that, does not have an opportunity to, to really learn from others. And when she gets married and has her first child, again, I don't know what the probabilities are, but I, they, they could be very low, she does not have access to her own mother or grandmother. They're living halfway across the country. So um, I, I think that... that um, I think, I think that one of the reasons that, that we have this anxiety about parenting, or the main reason maybe we have anxiety about parenting, and we have all these notions about that evolve into overprotection and, 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 and over solicitation, over concern about the child, is because we don't have, um, there's, the, the parents are are anxious because they have not had any prior, they haven't seen it in action, they haven't seen it working. Um, and and so they, they are uh, all at sea, not, they don't have any, a, a good model to work from, from their own prior experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so uh, about formal schooling, would you say that uh, when it is introduced into traditional societies and even r rural areas, um, because we have this contrast between uh, our parents from more modern societies and the ones from the traditional ones teach their children or raise their children even, would you say that uh, w one of the main issues there is that that when when children are forced to go to school in a society where they don't get formal teaching from older people that they they are not used to that and and that's one of the reasons why sometimes they are even beaten by the teachers unfortunately to to force them to learn something there uh, and and that that is one of the reason why they fail or or fail more often than the other children and on the other end because what children learn in the modern education system is is very counterintuitive when compared with what they would naturally learn. Yes, yes, there, absolutely. The um, modern modern education is is one could argue extremely unnatural. 
it, it just, just humans, children, <clears throat> think, of, think about children in the world, okay? What are they most noted for? What are they, what do you see them doing? You see them running around. They're active. They're busy. Even if they're working or trying to work or trying to learn to work, it's active. Number one, what about the child in the classroom? It is generally not very active. It is inactive, okay? Physically inactive, sitting there for hours every day. Second thing we see in the village is children are in control of what they're doing. They're, they're not following orders. They're not following instruction. They're not, they're, they're, they're self-guided. They are, whatever it is they're doing comes from within. There's something they want to do. They're in charge of it. If they get hurt, well, typically the attitude is be more careful next time. It's your fault, you know, your fault. Whereas in the classroom, they can't take any initiative, almost no initiative, because it's all set by the teacher. The curriculum, the lessons, the textbook, it's all controlled beyond their control. They're just like a machine that will be turned on, turned off, slowed down, speeded up, uh, uh, operated, so on. So we could go down and generate an enormously, surprisingly, frighteningly long list of contrasts between a student in a classroom and a child in, let's say, a foraging society in the jungle of Amazonia, uh, fishing, hunting, gathering fruits, gathering tubers, mostly with other children, independently, figuring things out on their own, having a good time. That's the other thing you see. Kids, whatever it is they're doing in the village, they're having a good time. They're, they're laughing. They're joking. It's playful. It's fun. They're in charge. They're kids. It's going to be fun. In the classroom setting, no, not so much. It's not a fun place to be. In the earlier days, of course, as you pointed out, um, much of what the teacher did was basically beat the children to get them to settle down and be quiet and, and immobile, beat the children to get them to stop taking the initiative to do whatever it was they were doing, but to wait for the teacher to tell them what to do. So um, the, the classroom is not a natural environment for children. It is not, it is not an ecology to borrow your terms, not an ecology to which they're well adapted. Mm, right, but, but even in the modern world, we, we could do better, and even in the modern education system. So, for example, uh, I, I don't know if you can talk specifically about this or not, but in Finland, mm -hmm. they seem to have a much better way of teaching children. And for example, they have much more time to play and they have shorter classes, particularly the, the younger children and so on. So would you say that uh, things like that, that gi uh, to give children more time to play and shorter classes could be uh, um, an effective way to, to try to make them learn better? And even because it seems that in Finland they get better results than in other countries, so for example, the US and even Portugal, so. Well, I've, I've been an admirer of um, initially Swedish. I, I spent, I had a Fulbright fellowship in, in Sweden in 1995 and focused a lot of my attention on the preschools there. I was in, very, very impressed at the time. Um, every day of the year, 365 days of the year, preschool children go outside and play for an hour. And it doesn't matter what the weather is. In other words, they don't keep them in if it's cold or snowy or windy. They had an expression. They said, there's no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothing. <laughs> and the children actually were had to have a certain type of, of, of bad weather clothing 
that was that was that was suitable to keep them comfortable and then in the preschool itself they had um these dryers with so the children would come in they would take their boots their rubber boots off and set them they each had their own place for their boots their rain jackets and their clothing would be dried there were there were dryers and it was all very very well organized to make sure that these children had outdoor play and and it was unsupervised. I mean, it wasn't like there were teachers telling them things to do. They were on their own. And so I've been an admirer of Scandinavian. And Finland gets singled out, but actually I think across Scandinavia, um, they've had some very different attitudes, different notions about children. But the question I have, and I'm not, this is where I really have little or no expertise. What I What concerns me or I shouldn't say concerns me, but what, what question I would raise is, can we generalize the Scandinavian results, the Scandinavian experiences, can we generalize them to uh, the rest of the world, even you know to the United States, the UK, or whatever? One of the issues there is that certainly at the time a lot of this, these policies were formulated and a lot of this research was done, Scandinavia was monocultural. Now there's a great deal of ethnic diversity as a result of influx of refugees. A question I would ask is, are these methods working equally well with the refugee children as they are with the, with the native-born children or the children, multi-generational children in Scandinavia? But yeah, I'm an admirer of that. There's, there's no question that, that um, Finnish schools, Scandinavian schools, are a lot happier place to be than um, schools more generally in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just two final questions. One of them would be, uh, are there any studies uh, done, and, and if so, do they provide any evidence for a relationship between the manifested capacity of a given child to learn mm -hmm. and the decision, and now I'm talking in traditional societies, of the parents to keep that child or, if necessary, to commit infanticide? Uh, <clears throat> the short answer is that there, there are no systematic studies per se. I mean, this is a rare event. An anthropologist do not spend decades and decades and decades living in a small community observing what's going on. And, you know, you're there for a year or two years at most. And so this is a rare event. We don't have enough uh, data, but certainly uh, infanticide has historically been extremely common um, in across culturally and also in European history, East, Chinese, Japanese, all practiced infanticide, um, and a long list of reasons to eliminate that child, among which are any signs of, uh, of disability, physical disability, mental disability. Um, there, there are... Um, I'm just thinking of one... one a recent book uh, based on research in uh, Ghana <clears throat> in a community in, in, in a rural community in Ghana where um, basically parents justified explained or community leaders explained the necessity for infanticide in such cases and they're basically saying look we're really really poor people um, a mother has a limited amount of time to devote. Children are expected to become self-sufficient in this society very, very quickly, very early. I was speaking earlier about seven-year-old girls actually taking care of their younger siblings, actually helping their mothers with, with the garden, with the market, marketing, and so on. So as young as six or seven kids the kids have to step up and not only take care of themselves, but also begin to help with care for others. So if there's a child, an infant is born that looks like it's going to 
be a heavier burden as an infant, that's bad. But what's even worse is that going forward, if the child lives, they will continue at a level of dependency that's unacceptable. It just it unbalances the whole thing. A mother, in a, in a traditional society, we speak about we speak about men as being breadwinners, but in point of fact, most studies show that women actually contribute strictly in terms of calories more to the family. Bring their food that they produce, whether as gatherers or as as gardeners, farmers. Up to the point where we have, before we have plow agriculture. So men come into the picture and play the critical role here in terms of heavy duty stuff like plow agriculture, anything that involves uh, 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 livestock. So women have this responsibility, not only for their own children, but for their, for their husband. Maybe there's an extended family, could be her mother-in-law is living with them. I mean, there, there may be a very really large household. That, the, that that one woman who at the prime of her life has this huge responsibility for caring for these people. These are people who are, who are healthy and alive and so on. So she does not want the added responsibility, very great additional responsibility of caring for a handicapped child. It, it's a big impact to have a domino effect, not just on her, but on her other children and on other members of the family that are dependent on her. Mm-hmm. Okay, and sorry, would you want to say? That, no, that's that's the explanation that would be given as to as to why the community does not want to keep this child. This child. Mm-hmm. Okay, so and just a final question, and because uh, last week uh, I interviewed Dr. Richard Lippe from California State University. We were talking about, he's a psychologist, and we were talking about uh, g- uh, gender and gender roles and so on, but uh, I, 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 don't, I don't want to, to keep it strictly to gender, but talking about a, co- a culture at large and so on, and because you're an, anthropology, uh, an anthropologist, I would like to have your take on this, because uh, I asked him specifically uh, uh, to give me examples of something he would consider to, uh, to be part of gender, and that would be completely a cultural construct. Uh, and wouldn't have any kind of biological, psychological, innate basis to it. Uh, and he said he couldn't give, uh, give me one because at the basis of human culture, there's our biology, our psychology, and the way and, and human culture doesn't occur uh, randomly. Uh, I mean, the, uh, at the basis of it, we have our psychology, like our, uh, our sociality, our moral sentiments, and so on and so forth. And so w- what I wanted to ask is that uh, if you think, uh, since you're an anthropologist, if you think that there's something in, in, that is part of human culture uh, that you would consider not to have uh, a biological or a psychological basis that is poorly a cultural construct. Um, I don't. I don't want to sound like a traitor to my tribe here, but I'd have to answer. I. It, it's very hard to think of anything that fits that uh, definition. Um, uh, I. I would certainly argue that psychologists, as, as I argued earlier in, in, our, in our discussion here, I would certainly argue that psychologists are usually guilty of uh, ethnocentrism, of, of think, generalizing from their own culture to the world um, and, and ignoring the importance of culture, the contribution of culture. On the other hand, um, um, as an evolutionary anthropologist, um, it, it, it's, it's very hard for me to argue that there is some significant cultural practices um, or, or, or gender patterns, for example, which are completely uh, constructed de, de novo within a culture and that have no, uh, cannot, cannot in any way be linked to some biological 
uh, uh, substratum. Um, so, so I, I would I would place my along. I think this is a continuum, you know, nature versus nurture, and um, I've argued in the past that that in weird society we tend to make turn nurture into nature. That is, we tend to take our child rearing practices and act as if they were natural, that they were they were fit this, for the species rather than cultural. And I would say the same thing. It's a continuum here. And I would I would try to keep it near the center, whereas I think psychologists typically will tend to deny nurture and anthropologists, traditional cultural anthropologists tend to deny nature. And I would rather be in the middle. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So just before we finish, Dr. Lancy, would you like to share with people where perhaps they can find and follow your work, perhaps something interesting you're working on at the moment? And, and I don't know if you're active on social media or not. Yes, um, let me, I am. There are several places that people could learn more. Um, first of all, uh, Psychology Today is a magazine in the United States which also has a website and on that website there are a bunch of bloggers. I am one of those bloggers so although I haven't contributed a great deal recently. Um, a book that uh, I published uh, two books actually three books in a couple of last couple of years in 2015 I published The Anthropology of Childhood second edition that book has a website, so they go to uh, go to that website or Facebook. It also has a Facebook page, the Anthropology of Childhood Facebook page, and in there I post a lot of con articles that are about contemporary child rearing. Then there's a book, um, a much smaller book, and aimed at a general audience called Raising Children: uh, Surprising Insights from Other Cultures. And uh, that's published by Cambridge, 2017. And I think that your, your, uh, the audience may find that quite interesting because it, many of the things we've talked about today um, are actually focused on in, in that book. They're, they're, it's all about the contrast, uh, just as we've been discussing, discussing throughout. And um, so I'd say those, 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 were the, the, those were the best places, the Facebook page, on the um, blog, the Psychology Today blog would, would be good sources for additional information. My most recent project, I uh, just submitted um, a paper to Current Anthropology, and in it I argue, I, I focus on children as helpers. I focus on a phenomenon which is interestingly is supported by laboratory psychology when there's rare cases where there's a complete congruence between the ethnographic record, what we see as anthropologists, and what is being found now in a series of lab studies on children as young as 14 months old, universally, apparently, universally uh, want to be helpful and take every opportunity to get engaged with people who are doing things, particularly working, tasks, and get involved and to try to help out and participate. And so this paper focuses on that phenomenon and explains from an evolutionary point of view why I think um, it's, it's a cultural universal, that there's a stage I call the helper, helper stage in human life history from about 14 months to about four years, five years old. Mm -hmm. That's the latest work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so great. Uh, Dr. Lancy, I think it was a wonderful conversation. I would really like to thank you for taking a bit of your time to being here with us today. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it very much, Ricardo. Okay, so uh, have a nice weekend. You too. Okay. If you appreciate my work, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash the dissenter. Thank you.